Good evening, Final Fantasy Randomizer fans, general enthusiasts, players, and most importantly, ducks. I'm your host this evening, June Bobby, and I'm really excited to be here, bringing you our uh, our first VOD review of Duck Boot Camp 2024. This week, our featured runner is DM Stewart, a longtime member of the community and frequent contributor via covering race comms across a variety of tournaments, who now gets to sit on the other side of the broadcast as I offer what I hope all of you will find to be constructive critiques, some more veteran insights, and for all the ducks, the rationale behind a lot of what I'm saying. Because DM Stewart has been around and experienced a lot of what the game has to offer, some of the information might seem a little deep at times, but I'm going to do my best to break it down. And if anything really seems like it's extending too far beyond the scope of this VOD review, I will do my best to rein it in, but I extend to all the viewers, uh, an invite to just hop into the Discord and at me, and I will help out where I can. Just to give a quick check before I continue on my whole shtick, can you all hear me, and is the stream looking good? All good, thank you. Just wanted to make sure. So, DM has emphasized to me before the broadcast that he wants to focus primarily on bigger time saves, so things like routing decisions, general map movement, and uh, just big picture ideas in general, right? Uh, with that in mind, some of my suggestions might seem very nitpicky, but I've watched this back uh, in bits and pieces a couple of times, and so some of the things that I say where it seems like, why are we calling this out? It's a three-second kind of time save. It turns into, uh, ultimately, what could be three minutes here and there, uh, and they're just the sort of things that we want to look out for as we start to progress deeper into the derby for sure. All right, so I am going to jump straight ahead to my timestamp here of champ select, or I suppose party select is what we would call it here, right? And so while, uh, while we're actually going through this, selecting the party, I just want to discuss that some of the flags over the next few weeks are going to force the use of specific parties or they're going to force restrictions on parties that push the ducks a little bit out of their comfort zone. Um, fighters in particular for this 101, they're a very safe choice. Uh, the expectation um, as DM is setting up for us right now with a fighter and a thief uh, is that our power is going to come from opening chests and not necessarily from levels. So. Um, at 70 to 120% scaling on stats and 100% on bosses, this is very tame. Um, fighters are safe, but they rely on gear. So at this point, if we're taking the thief, it's because we want lockpicking or running, and the, um, the lockpicking isn't turned on for the 101 flags. So uh, white mage here is my preferred mage um, as well. You have a 5 in 32 chance that a white mage spell is going to be able to, to sweep an enemy party, and then we can utilize the light axe, defensive buffs, light magic, like all those things as guarantees are clutch. Uh, the black mage to complement the party results in guaranteeing that you have fast and temper, which on almost every flag set is going to be like the thing that you want to be able to get through the end of the game. But um, realistically, at this scaling, you don't need both of them. With one or the other, you're generally fine. And so I'm not going to hate on a red mage pick. I personally don't care for them too much. Um, but there are a lot of sweepers and a lot of buffs that you guarantee by taking a black mage. Now, DM just posted in uh, the chat now, looking at about level 25 to 28 for Topher clearance. With this party and this scaling, I would say a safe Topher, you're looking at earlier 20s, right? Like you could probably 23, 24 be very confident in your dive here. If you're really like a little unsure, but you have the the power gauntlet and some fast chargers or something, maybe you're looking at level 20. Um, there are runners, I know, absolutely I know, because I'm friends with a lot of them, that would take this party and be totally comfortable going into Topher at level 15, 16. Because at that scaling, you just sort of plow through the bosses and you hope that you don't see anything super nasty and so sometimes you want to make that decision on the fly but early on uh, for especially for VOD review and for ducks I say find your thresholds right like find where you are super comfortable going into Topher and then go completely in the other direction and say when am I like 
definitely not wanting to go into Topher, and then go in anyway and see what happens, right? You're going to Goldilocks this a bit, and, and then you'll get a better feel for when you can actually get through this. Um, is there anything else I want to talk about while we were selecting characters? Um, I mentioned Red Mages before, right? A lot of people took them on the Monday Night Race. A lot of you will take that uh, in your parties in the Duck Derby. Um, Red Mages are useful because they are jack-of-all-trades, but they are very non-specific, right? And so if you need to guarantee life or you need to guarantee fast temper nuke, something like that, you really want one of the specialized mages. The way around that in a this type of flag set might have been to say, you know what, I'm not taking the thief. I don't care about running. I just want to murder everything and I'll take a rainbow. So we'll take a, a red mage, white mage, and a black mage. And we'll just say, you know what, no matter what spells land, we're going to have something to move forward. So I think that that is where I'm going to leave this. And uh, yeah, let's get into the actual run. I've got one surprise for everybody around encounter manipulation, which gets a little deep, but I'm excited to share. And then everything else, uh, we'll take it as it comes. All right, so let's get into this. I believe the race starts at 26.43 on this timer. So let me pull that forward. Yep, we see the countdown going down now. Yes, this was a, a great seed to learn about encounter manipulation. So, as the race starts, we go straight up into Canaria. This is exactly the right play, right? We go check out the magic shops, sure. There's Life 2 that we see is locked to only the White Mage right now. Invis 2, definitely a late game spell. And then we come to this black magic shop and we see also that we don't really have great spells. I'm going to pause it there. Oop, that's an awkward frame. Let's try something else. We don't have great spells in either of those um, pools of magic, right? We're not going to be able to take out Garland by just casting something. Uh, so already our mind is going, and I see DM jumped into the menu here. We need to get a weapon for Garland. We're not going to want to punch him down. Even at 100%, we're not going to want to punch him down. So we're looking at the items. We're looking into our, our weapons and armor. Um, heavily suggest you just check the flags right beforehand this is again nitpicky but it's a five ten second time save if you know that you're getting an explorer set if you know that you have um, a starting caster weapon or not or something uh, you don't even need to worry about it uh, but here we see that we don't actually have anything so we go into the weapon shop and uh okay let's talk about those weapons for a second i'm actually gonna scoot back just a little bit Oop, i'll find you somewhere Eek. This is... Let's see if I can do that. Uh, nope, too far. There we are. Okay. Sorry about that. We're back in the weapon shop. <laughs> I'll, I'll get used to this in, in just a moment. So having just purchased all of this stuff, we're already left with this really rough decision of what can I actually buy? Um, silver plus three hammer. 1,000% if you're going to rely on the fighter here, just get it. We don't need to worry about any more gold. We're going to have enough gold to take the in. Silver hammer at a plus three especially, this is going to this is gonna take down Garland very easily. I think you get fixated on, oh, I need a sword. Oh, I want something that's going to last me even longer. That silver hammer could actually last you a pretty long time. Um, but that's, that's something that if you bought more of the spells, you don't even have money for that, right? Not a huge fan that we didn't check the hint giver. And, uh, or the item shop. Now I want to draw your attention that at 39 seconds we take this encounter. And at the beginning of this party select, I'm going to let this encounter run through. At the beginning of this party select, I said, you take a thief for two reasons, one of which isn't here. The other reason is to run, right? You named the character Run. We are 20 seconds into this battle. We still have not run. We are now going to be chugging pure potions. We have a very limited supply of things that were gifted gifted to us, and and we have two members poisoned. We're going to have to heal everybody up. We are now 40 seconds into the first battle. Yes, no, I, I totally understand where this is going. I'm just drawing attention to the, the timing in with regards to this battle versus uh, where we might find that gold otherwise. Right, so we're level three. It's taken us 
literally about a minute here to get to level three. Now, in the context of the race, right, 55 minutes was the end time. So this is more than one fifty-fifth of the entire game was spent on a battle of imps. So be careful with that. Uh, we go back in. So, I mean, if you're going to commit to the battle, I'm glad that you did. And then you, you wind up buying the sword. That's great. We'll save the game again. Still want to check the item shop, because this is now the second time we've gone into Canaria, and we don't know where the key item is, right? But we do know where two encounters were, and so I see you are already playing this game, but I don't know that everybody else is. Uh, I'll call out the encounter manipulation a little bit later. <laughs> a tent in that location. So for anybody that didn't catch it, he did just hard reset over this. Took those two encounters that we knew were pretty early into the cycle. Finds this Vorpal. This is a greed check right now. At two minutes in, it's kind of dicey. You, you should be feeling a little behind on Garland at two minutes in. And so we check all of these things. You're three steps from the stairs at that point. Save the game. Ah, Siberian Bull with the question, would it be a wise decision to check the dwarf chests? Well, we see how Garland is going to go, right? Like, if we can just get through Garland, that would, would be great. But we forgot to equip the longsword. So now we reset... We go to equip the longsword. Now consider, we were in Topher, in Tof, sorry, not Topher, at two minutes. We're going back in to get the same items. Right, that Vorpal, you want that Vorpal. That Vorpal is a late game item. Something that you want to consider when you get these boxes, especially the second time around. This next box, boom, there's your gold for the seed. Right, you're almost never going to be equipping that Opal, brace, uh, opal Gauntlet. Opal Bracelet, you definitely will. But Opal Gauntlet, you almost never will. Uh, but again, I would have saved beforehand, and this is going to sound nitpicky. This Invis 2 is doing nothing here. It's just, it is actually a waste of time because you have to go through the whole cycle of it hitting your team. Again, we get the reset. This is, I know, this is tedious and it feels bad to look at again. <laughs> Sorry. But uh, super necessary things, right? Like when you equip the item, make sure you save after that. Um because you'll forget and you get caught up in these moments. And in DM, I know you've already thought this through. You've had sleepless nights since you ran the race. This is now the third time we're checking this box. Um, and the worst part about it is nobody can equip any of these things yet. And so if you're not planning on selling them, you can easily just come back here and pick that up on your way in after you beat the fiends or after you get your airship and you've promoted. But again, we missed a save. So, like, if Garland leads with that fire three again, we may just have to loot those chests again. So it's, it would be really helpful to, I guess, um, notice their, notice the enemy patterns a little bit instead of focusing so much on what you were doing. If you know you're going to forget something, that's a good point. If you know you're going to forget it, like, mentally, leave something, leave, like, a notepad open on your desk or even a, a literal piece of paper on your desk. Um... And just jot that down. Like, when I go into Topher, this is this is my checklist now. So now we got Sarah home. We got the crown. We're getting a ship here. This is great. So yeah, most people are not going to be talking to the king before rescuing Sarah. But that is always an option. Uh, I'm actually going to pause here after we check. Um, finally checking the item shops restocking on some things. Uh, just want to pause to point out how this could have gone a little bit differently at the two-minute mark. Um, we we got level three at the two-minute mark from the imps, right? Now you have not only enough gold to buy the weapon, but you would have also had enough gold to just walk over to Provoka, and you have the, the spell charges for level two spells, right? So if you're thinking, I only really want to kill Garland, you now have another eight spells worth of opportunities by just walking over to Provoka. Um, and there's nothing that Sarah or the king is going to offer you that you would need for Provoka, right? So the, the worst case scenario, you have what you do find out, which is the item shop is there that has the, the key item. But um, level two spells, don't sleep on them, especially if that level one stuff isn't working out for you, right? I think here... This is now the fourth time in Canaria. I think here is when you go on the boat. Oh no, you don't get immediately on the boat. We burn two encounters. And then we go on the boat. Okay, so this is where I'm going to pull up my slides. 
Hope you're all ready for this magnificence that's about to happen. So we got that up, and let me just enable it. Okay. Some of you may have heard the encounter table is kind of like a deck of cards, and I'm not super huge on, on this um, metaphor specifically, but I will try to explain to you in as briefly as I can how the encounter table actually works and what we mean when we say encounter table. So for the ducks, you're going to hear this come up a tremendous amount that you want to manipulate an encounter table. And so early on, you're really just learning what spells do I need to buy? Where do I need to go? But once you get like, I don't know, just a few seeds under your under your belt, you're like, okay, well, now why are people beating me 20 minutes faster? And how did they find the levels that they needed to? Um, the encounter table is not like a boss. Let me, <laughs> let's, let's pull this up. Uh, where am I? PowerPoint, you are there. Okay, so... I actually, <laughs> I actually loaded up my Monday seed and just walked through all 256 steps to map out this encounter table. So what we've discovered so far, just based on DM's play here, is that there was eight steps before encounter one, then there was another six steps and encounter two. There happens to be this really long run after encounter two, but so far we've only taken a few enough steps that we know for, for certain where encounter one and encounter two are. Okay, based on the encounter rate, the thing that I actually want to point out here, well, one thing I suppose is that on land you'd expect six encounters, right? So there's our six encounters. I mapped out the rest of them. We still haven't seen these E3 through E6. Um, on sea, however, when you are on the boat, it is a 2 in 256 chance of getting the encounter. Um, and then in most dungeons, you're back up to 6 out of 256. And I say most dungeons because I'll, I'll clarify what that is. Um, so the encounter table is laid out like this. It's not true random. You have, once the seed is rolled, the encounters are all laid out in whatever fashion they are, over 256 steps. And then what will happen is, if you just only walked on the overworld, you would see the same encounters in a row. And then you'd see them a second time in a row. Then you would, sorry for this poor graphic, you'd flip it over. You'd reverse the order in which you encountered those things, including the steps, and then you'd flip it one more time. Now, this is not super relevant because you're not really ever walking this much, especially not without saving, because once you start to identify, oh yeah, I had these really long gaps, you're gonna be constantly resetting this table. But this is, this is how it's laid out. Um, why am I calling attention to any of this? Because we're doing a VOD review and now I'm pulling off this slideshow on encounter manipulation because I saw that we burned those first two encounters before we got on the boat because DM wants to go straight to Provoca. Don't blame him. This would be really great. The thing is, if I draw your attention over here, after eight steps, we get encounter one. And then after six steps, we get encounter two on land. However, after eight steps, we get encounter one on the sea and then six steps later, nothing happens. It is valuable to find where those missed encounters are on the sea so you know how to um, encounter manipulate around there. Like, when can I just, can I, could I have just hard reset and gone straight to Provoca? I'm going to test that immediately because that means that every time I'm on the boat, I could just hard reset and I will have 140 steps to play with. And so getting um getting that under your belt is a little bit more uh valuable than you might think um and so let me just one last thing show you how this encounter table actually works so i'm going to use the deck of cards analogy just in in the um, sense of i'm going to assign every step a letter uh, a number a value i guess i shouldn't have called that one a one but assume that my deck has a one in it sure um, and so for the first eight steps, we had these kind of low values. And then all of a sudden on step nine, they dealt us a jack. And then on step, uh, what is that going to be? 16, they dealt us a 10. Are the sea encounters always a subset of the land encounters? Yes. And so that's what I'm about to show you here, right? Um, what actually happens if you imagine that over the 256 steps, you've dealt out all of these values of cards, the land is asking the question, hey, 
did you step on a jack or high? Oh, sorry, did you step on a 10 or higher? So when you're on land and you step on, on this one, yeah, I stepped on a jack. Cool, that's higher than a 10. I'm going to have an encounter now. When I get to the 16th step, are you 10 or higher? Yeah, I'm a 10. Okay, great. Now you have an encounter. The C, however, has a lower threshold for this. So the C is saying, no, I only care about jacks and above. I don't care about tens. So by the time we wind up at the first encounter after eight steps, yes, it still matches. It still fits the criteria for a C encounter. But then when we get up to the 10, it's like, no, you're not a jack. I don't have to worry about you. You might as well just be one of these other little boxes. Um, the reason why I have highlighted this one in blue, this other high value, is because there are some dungeons that play around with other thresholds as well. So you have like the Bridge of Destiny with uh, Tiamat is going to have more encounters than the six. And so that would be asking the question, for example, did you step on a nine or above? Or did you step on an eight or above? I, I don't remember what the actual odds are or how many they're going to distribute into that 256, but it is higher than the six out of 256 that we have for the dungeons. Last thing I'm going to say about the encounter table. I like to think of it as you have a pointer, right? And so you go to take your first step and it checks, do I have an encounter here? Nope, my pointer is over here. Do I have an encounter here after my second step? Nope, three steps, four steps, five steps. I've gone six steps. You know what? I'm feeling, I'm feeling dicey here. I don't know where this encounter is. I'm going to save. So here is what happens when you save the game. You can choose to reset the game. And if you do a soft reset, your pointer does not move. No matter how many times you do a soft reset, your pointer will not move. So I've taken my soft reset. I've gone one step. I've gone two steps. Oh no, I've got this encounter. I don't want this encounter. I'm going to reset. So I soft reset. I might have moved back two tiles on the overworld, but my pointer now is after the encounter. And so... Now that I'm after this encounter, I no longer have to worry about encounter one. I can take six more steps, save my game, take another step. Oh no, I should be in an encounter during this step. Reset the game. My pointer is now here. If I do a hard reset at any point in the seed, accidentally or otherwise, this pointer goes back to here. That is, a music box isn't the worst analogy there, but it does prevent you from getting right back to the very beginning, which is what a hard reset will do. But that is, in seven minutes, how the encounter manipulation works, is do I want to keep my pointer moving forward along this list, or do I want to reset it back to the very beginning? Because I know where certain encounters are. Uh, so if a dungeon and overworld are both there, yes, they do match at the same steps. So. Um, You'll see, if you go back to a couple of the other VODs from the Monday Weekly, if you do a hard reset out of a dungeon and take 20 steps, you're going to be on that portion of the run, which is 127 steps long, right? And so then we can um, just go straight down the dungeon. And then once you hit this little cluster, you know, hey, I've got another really long run. So, okay, that is, that is it for my PowerPointing right now. I'm going to cancel that out, and let's get right back to the actual gameplay, if there are no other questions. And if there are other questions, please post them, and I'll, I'll discuss them as we go. Okay, so now, now we're in Provoca, but we don't have a tremendous amount of money. Um, we should have just enough to buy a sweeper here. So we luck out on that particular sweeper, uh, being under 200 gold. Checking white magic... Uh, don't hate it, right? Like, if you could have afforded Harm 4 there, it would have been pretty nice. But you probably want to come back here for the Hint Giver anyway. And then we go to Bicky. Fortunately, you did uh, save at an inn <laughs> and remember to refill your spell charges. The Invis 2 here, I'm going to tell you, you're never casting Invis 2 on a normal battle unless you are grinding um, a trap tile or, like, you're, t you're taking a boss early. Invis 2 here is just... It is a time waste. But the ice 3 goes off. There's no problems here. Get some more levels. We get a little bit more gold. And we get ourselves a ruby. So, so now we're thinking, oh, maybe I get an earlier canal. That would be nice. Here's, here's a big pain point, right? We see a key for almost 6,000 gold. 
and we walk into the armor shop. And I'm hoping at some point it crossed your mind to, to consider, do I want to sell this? But if it hasn't, you just saw the Opal uh, plus four again, you absolutely want to sell that, right? We have a key item. I don't want to be coming back to Provoka. That shop is all the way on the other side of the map for the town. Um, you, you will never want to come back into this town again. And so the key being there is going to cost you a lot of time when you have to route Provoka back in. Um, so I would say if you're going to make those greed checks early in Toph, um, or like you stop at Matoya along the way because you know you want a couple extra bucks, do yourself a favor and allow yourself to sell high quality gear that isn't going to be necessary because that's going to save you a ton of time. But now you've bought a silver sword, which theoretically could uh, take you through endgame. A silver plus one is a is a weapon that could absolutely win this game with fast and temper. Um, but we have that four pull plus five, right? So another just little bit of, not only is that a like a time sink to go back to buy that sword, but now you've taken all the money that you do have and you're saying level three and four spells. No, who needs you? Because now again, we don't have the money. We didn't sell that opal plus four. And for a thousand more gold, sure, you could have had fast. I don't know that that would have been the, the primary goal here. But we're going to have to come back to Elfland. And like number one duck tip, don't double dip. The best thing that you could do for yourself is guarantee that when you walk into an environment, you have the tools necessary to get all the way through it. And so in the context of a town, what that's going to mean is make sure you have enough money to buy the spells on your way in. So we know the encounter table, at least the first part of it. We're dropping those. Great. So now we have, I mean, this should take us all the way to Marsh Cave. I'm going to speed us up a little bit here. Oh, we do have a crown. So let's do that. We're going to... This Astos is, is no problem. You have some high damage spells. We're going to move a little fast at this part. We have a slab. You can't really do anything with that. If you know that he has a slab, I think the Hint Giver actually does tell you. So if you know he has a slab, maybe you convince yourself, hey, I'll just come back to him when I get an airship. Um, but again, so this is what just happened with um, taking that Astos fight is we go, oh man, now I have money. Now I want to buy those spells before I forget to. You're going to have to come back to Elfland once you get the, the herb anyway. So... Do we need those spells right that second, right? Like, is, is fast going to be that big of a difference? Because what it did was cause you to walk halfway across the continent again. Probably going to burn two encounters here. This is the thing that I, I recoiled the most when I watched this the first time. Um, I cannot think of a single thing in any one of these chests that would make me go, okay, yeah, that was worth it. We know that the incentive item is on the bottom floor of Marsh. And more than that, we know we have this kind of big hero run. We can get most of the way down there. And so then even if Marsh Cave is dangerous, we probably get to see the key item and decide if that's something that we need. There is value, even in a failed dive, where you bump into something and, and it bounces you out of the dungeon. But if you already have the incentive item, uh, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Right, so if we want the money for the shop item, sure, but we're going to have, I can think of five better chests down on Marsh 2 and 3 that that we can check before having to say, you know what, maybe I should check the, uh, the top of the Marsh split. Routing here looks really good. Uh, I believe we're going to take an extra step somewhere over here. Running with the party, by the way, this is absolutely what we should be doing, right? We have a thief in tow. Okay, so that's that step shouldn't have uh, really happened, right? That um, off off the bottom of the wall. We want to try to stay at the bottom of the wall as much as possible. That won't advance the pointer on the encounter table. So I just showed you that whole visualization of where it moves. If you take that first chest from the bottom uh, and then come back around and then straight up, uh, you know what? Actually, that was a very interesting way of approaching those chests. That might be an equal amount of steps. 
I'll hold off on, on judgment there. Now we just have the uh, the thief casting Invis 2 for us instead. I don't mind that you cast Ice 3 on it. I don't mind that you uh, took out this party. It's okay. I mean, this is a volcano encounter. So 740 XP, 3000 gold. It's like just enough that maybe you you have enough for those spells at level 3. I, I don't hate it. If we're still checking for gold, though. Hmm. Yeah, this is something... These are really, really greedy checks. If you have warp or exit at this point, I'm going, okay, maybe you you sneak something out of this. You knew that you weren't going to take an encounter. You can get out of here. But that many extra steps, that's going to cost you over the run of this getting out of Marsh Cave. But for the, the new runners... Everything he's doing here otherwise is perfect as far as his walking. Walking in front of doors does not take away the encounter table. Walking at the bottom of that room right there, perfect. So, yeah, all of these things, great. Um, DM bringing up that we're looking for something we could equip on the thief or armor for the fighter. The fighter is going to probably get armor at some point anyway, but you have two. You have the white shirt now and invis too, so nobody should be getting hit. Um, and on the flip side, you have a Thief for running, not for hitting. You have that Vorpal plus 5. If you really, really, really wanted the Thief to equip something, you give him the Vorpal, and then you find yourself a Masa for the night. But we want to try to avoid getting into Elfland um, too many times. It's a big town. So I didn't notice a timer when you left there, but going from Elfland, now we're back in Provoka, and now we're getting this key. It's going to take us somewhere else, right? We have it's about two minutes right there that if you sell that opal, now you're saving. Is me playing this on 2x, by the way, okay with everybody right now? We haven't really done anything... Uh, Drastic. I will. I will slow this down as we start to look at some more specific behaviors. Okay. So Canaria Lock isn't an incentive location. It's again a nice to have, but realistically, your money at this point is going to come from. Um, it's going to come from battles, right? Like you're going to have to level throughout this game. And it's going to come from incidental chests like that one. So you get your adamant. It's not TNT. Thank you for not going down to the dwarf armory here. You never really want to double dip that. Unless you had a hint giver that was like, there's a loose item in the dwarf armory for me. Um, yeah, never doing that. That Sahag encounter was very scary with trance. Uh, that's something that I would try to route out with the encounter manipulation. So now we have our Katana 3, we have our Vorpal 5, we have a Rustic and two Casters of Invis. At this point we have our endgame gear. There is literally not another chest outside of the incentive chest that we need to open. Is it comfortable? No. But is it doable? Absolutely. At 100% scaling, you are going to have, you're going to hit so hard, they won't have a chance to hit you back. That ice shield with the chain armor, there's your... That's enough. That's endgame absorb for that fighter. Otherwise, walking around, routing is... Routing is fine everywhere that I'm not saying don't go back. Right? Like, we went to Canaria a whole lot. We've been to Elfland a couple of times. Um, as far as turning in key items, generally speaking, you want to go um, where the items are leading you. Crescent is always a nice one to just pick up, especially if you have a canoe, uh, because that will that's a freebie. But if you don't have the canoe, you're having to travel all the way around the world. It's what I happened to do on Monday's seed, but I don't blame anybody for taking the statistically significant choice of Marsh Cave. Okay, I didn't watch from this point. I'm going to... Mm, 
I want to make a guess here as to where you're going, because this is a very big decision point for for a lot of runners in this game, is do I go to Volcano or do I go to Ice? The, the draws are there for both, right? Volcano is definitely going to get you closer to a goal. Um, it is a much shorter path from here to Volcano. There are treasure chests along the way if you really want to be greedy, but your way out is generally going to be carry. You're not walking back out. Uh, there is, however, an incentive item in Volcano. So it could be the incentive we need, and then we just pick it up and go to carry. Um, the alternative is, I know that there is an incentive in Ice Cave, but Ice Cave is dangerous. I think we are only about level 9 at this point, uh, and we're forced into one of these two. I guess i guess i would say i would say ice cave if you're not super comfortable but you can do volcano at this point you have two invis casters you have fade you have um oh, what other spells did the the black mage get i think the black mage actually doesn't have quad x which i i should have called out when we saw it at provoca you absolutely want quad x on this black mage especially at 100 percent scaling because carry has exactly uh what is it 600 health like one fade one swing and a quad x is going to be good enough here oh i hate this <laughs> it, it feels so good to open all these boxes but there's nothing in any of them that you really really need if you had warp, there's a slight case to be made because you warp back to the, the start of this floor. Um, but as far as routing on this floor goes, even armory aside, let me let me see if I can pull back a sec so I can show it. Uh, where are we? Nope, nope, still in, still there. Let's go back, back, back. I want to come to the start of that floor. Okay, we'll get to the start of the floor in a second. Okay, routing on this floor, and this seems trivial, but you're going to see it um, a little bit. Let me, okay, cool, I have that. Um, you definitely, where am I? On? Oh, you can't see it on the screen. Give me one second. Okay, cool, right over there. So this tile right here, right in front of the door, is a, um, it's a free tile, right? Like, we're not going to take any encounters here. We don't take any encounter movement on a lava tile. So going all of this way, not only will you never get into an encounter, but you're not advancing the encounter table either. Down here, you have to take an encounter. So your choice is to go down or to go across those three tiles. Just take that one step down because then you follow this and then you can just follow that all the way to the end. And that routing, even though it seems like a little bit out of the way, it saves you th uh, two steps on the encounter table, which could be the, the make or break in a dungeon that is seven floors long. All right, that's, that's my shtick on this one. Try to step on as much lava as possible. And also, don't heal yourself until you are about to step off the lava. A uh, grind tile suggestion. Okay, so... Well, I'll let this. I'll let volcano play out while I address grind tile. Yeah, we aren't grinding with a fighter party. The only time I consider a grind at the fighter level is towards the very end of the seed. If like I really didn't, I will take fights in sea and sky. But otherwise, really good routing through volcano here. Perfect routing there. Let's see what happens. Uh, okay. So in this room, let's see if you do it, and then I will try to address it. No. So in order to get, um, where am I? Nope, that's not where I am. Right, we go down here, and then up, and then around. So that is six free steps. If you just go down at the stair, then you can come back. You can choose to go up and, and collect this one. That's, that is a greedy chest right up there. But then we come back down, you're outside the door, this is a free tile, inside the door is a free tile. Every one of these steps along this wall and down through that path is a free step. Then we come over here, 
we go straight up. We don't go off. We're not going, oh, no, I don't want to use heal pots. We're going, no, I don't want to step forward on the encounter table. I want to make sure that I am encountering the least amount of things in Volcano as possible. The only dungeon that I would welcome fights is Sky, because Sky is going to have some very, very juicy XP fights. But for the most part, yeah, we do that greed check. I'm never checking that box. We're never coming over here. Um, and if you are coming over here, make sure you step on as much uh, as much as you can for the lava. We found two light axes at this point. We should be moving at least one of them to the white mage, because that is a free harm too. We're going to see this tile downstairs. So the only risk there is um, we're going to be forced to see that tile. And if that was a very dangerous tile, we didn't want to see it twice. Uh, why don't I want to see encounters in C? It's a resource drain, and they tend to be more dangerous because there is more, um, there are more creatures in a pack in C. Yeah, so Pickles has it, right? They're good encounters. So, like, if you get a pile of sea snakes, that's actually a decent encounter. But when you get the whole party platter, it's you have three, four enemies that you don't know their scripts. But. But even the the say the um, R say hag and the Wiz say hag packs, you don't want to deal with them if they have, even if they have heal, right? Now you're just sitting there and you're wasting seven turns of nine characters each. So we do do volcano. I'm hoping that we get this orb. I didn't watch this. We are healing up for sure. Let's let's slow this down. We get our three hits. Carry hits us. We get a fast off. Okay, so by going with Invis 2 and fast, you're committing to fighting. This is the perfect case for Quad X. That White Mage should have gone with Fade right away. Keep in mind the, the boss scaling. It might be the single most important indicator of what party you are taking and how high you are taking it. Um, at 100% stats and, and HP scaling, carry should be a pushover. Um, and, and we're treating it almost like carry two here with multiple invis casts fast. Um, like, like all that stuff just doesn't need to happen. Just get rid of the, the boss as quickly as you can. We are very high level now. There is no need to take a single encounter until you get to see your sky. All right, so at this point, I hope we're moving into Ice Cave. We know that we need an incentive. Yeah, so we're going straight up to Ice Cave. It's really the only place that we can go. So let's see what happens here. Burning the encounters, I like it. Are we going to burn again outside the door? We are. I don't know that, I, that you need to. This dungeon is far too long without warp or exit. Um, you're going to run through the encounter table. So you'll just be back at the beginning of it anyway. It's six of one, half a dozen of the other. And I know that you were calling it out on comms last night, so I'm not going to belabor this point. But you're going to know how to walk through this room if you wanted to um, do the drop down. My recommendation, since we don't have warp, would be just walk. I th Wait, do we have walk? Did Was this the seed with that? No. I don't need to check this trap tile. We don't need to check that box. Just walk straight up into a hole. Um, it's nice that the metal slimes exist. But we don't... We're not... Yeah. These. This is way too many checks. You have your endgame weapons. You have your party levels. I'll pose the question to you while this is playing, DM. What exactly are you hoping to find there? Because what we found was a, a white dragon with poison. I think we have an incentive Masa. We have an incentive Ribbon. You see this eye now and you, you get baited into... Or I mean, you could, I don't know if you do. But you're level 18. You're not even fighting it, right? Like we found the trap tile. And we're not going to be taking it because there, it, there's no incentive to at this point. This party at this current level, 
you throw a tail at them so that they can uh, promote and actually use those weapons, congratulations, this, this party is already ready. And then we get unfortunately rewarded with the chime. So Ice Cave isn't a necessity here. So I uh, I sh probably should have been running the tracker, and I apologize that I didn't. There is either something that we didn't turn in. Did we turn in the herb yet? So in general, uh, I, I might as well speak. We did turn in the herb, thank you. In general, um, you don't want to do herb. Um, Oh, that's right. We now have Earth Cave available. We got the Rod from the Sages, and we have a Ruby from Titan. Yeah, I am 99,999 out of 100,000 times going to Melmond Continent before I go to Ice Cave here. I forgot that we we had Melmond Continent open. Um, if you recognized that, then we shouldn't have been in this river system at all, actually. I'm having Seed Bleed from uh, the Thursday Night Race, so I apologize that I have missed that. I, I meant to call it out because you have Titans, you have Sarda, and you have Earth Cave. So you have three possible items in those locations, and all of them are going to be way easier to get to and deal with than carry would have been. Although the carry play, I don't mind. But Ice Cave is so out of the way relative to the river that even if it is safe and necessary, if it's not necessary to get a floater, um, then don't do it. Right? Like, I would exhaust every possible other option to get a floater than to check Ice Cave and happen to stumble into it. Can't do Melmond until after carry. Why is that? So, Ice is a trick. Ice is not actually proximity to Volcano. Um, it is as the crow flies. But it is not close with respect to everything else in the game. Um, if you ever did have to come back, right? Like if you got your canal out of carry and then you go straight to Melmond Continent, right? And then you find out that Melmond doesn't have the floater. Oh no, I needed to go to Ice Cave. You're not wasting time here because Titan and Sarda, I mean, they're right next to each other. Um... If you have to drop off at the Dwarves now, or Matoya, right? Like, they're pretty close. And if you absolutely have to go back to Ice Cave, you can just do it from Provoke a Dock. So you don't need to actually go through the river system to get there. It is much closer to go via Provoke a Dock or just north of Crescent Lake than it is to um, have to canal back from the volcano. But yeah, otherwise, I mean, like, this looks good. The routing, yeah, the routing that costs you is going to Ice Cave. I know that I didn't go to Ice Cave until I had Warp or Exit, and that would probably be my recommendation every time if you can help it. So if you start with a caster that happens to have Warp or Exit, like Teleport Magic, by all means, go to Ice Cave right away because you're just going to grab the item and exit out. You do not want to um, spend any time in Ice Cave, certainly. And you don't want to walk there. Alright, so we're zipping through Earth Cave. Making a lot of checks here. The, the metric that I was told early on, and that I use, is that every time you open a chest, you are guaranteeing that you add three seconds. Right, just the the button presses and letting the dialog box come up and then disappear. So we get blessed with our incentive ribbon. We're putting it on Susan, our white mage. Um, this might be controversial. If the white mage has life, sure. Um, but I tend to put that ribbon on the thief because I want the thief getting out of battles. I don't want it getting stunned. I don't want it getting burned down. We luck into another ribbon here. Um, honestly, never should have found it. They're nice to haves, but it's very easy to get this confirmation bias of, well, but when I made this check last time, I got a really good item. And it's like, well, 
yeah, if you check 120 chests in the game, you're going to get good items at some point. Um, that doesn't mean that all of them were worth it just to get to that point. So your routing here is perfect. For anybody that didn't catch that in Earth Cave, I am going to pull that back a little bit. Right, Oop, That was a little too much now. We're going down through the middle, and then you want to go with this downward um, trajectory. You want to go down and left and then up. And, like You don't want to do that whole towards the top and around. These, this middle path is the optimal path. Having taken down carry, Lich should be a pushover, especially with two ribbons. The worst he could do at you is, I don't know, throw out a blaze or... Yeah, oh, there it is. <laughs> like, okay, boohoo. You're level 20. All right, we've got ourselves some orbs. At this point, I think the seed opens up to you. There's there's not else, nothing else really that you can do but start turning in those items, including the TNT. Did we... We did talk to Dr. Un, right? Ooh. Okay, so this is a this is definitely a routing mistake here. Um, leaving Melmond, you can just zip right over to that river and go to the, the TNT. Which happens to, in this case, give us the floater. Which, on one hand, would mean that you're probably not incentivizing ordeals because you're just not going to want to go there with a floater. Um, but again, the hint givers would have told you ordeals is what it has, right? I think this wound up being the tail in the seed. Ordeals had a lot of good gear. Yeah, there's our power gauntlet. There's our dragon armor. And Aegis Shield. Right, this this fighter now is unbeatable. So we're doing a lot of inventory management too. That's, I suppose, something that we should address also. Um, if every time you go to open a box, you're going, oh no, this wasn't worth it. This is super worth it now. It, it's very rare that you're going to be like incrementally improving your gear, right? Every time you open up a new box, you're like, oh, I wish I had that. You're You're not even really thinking. You're going into your menu and you're saying, Ah, yeah, these are obvious things that I can throw away. Which means the last time, or the first time that you're in the menu, throw away as much as you can. Right? You don't want to be doing these these full cleans. Like, just... Um, or, sorry, you don't want to be doing these piecemeal cleans. You want to be doing it one at a time. Just wipe it all. Okay, so level 20. Now we're definitely ready for... Um, for Topher, uh, for the Ducks, the Pro Ring, the Aegis Shield, and the Dragon Armor make the fighter almost ribboned. Like, if you throw those three things on the knight, um, you can pretty much ignore everything. There is the chance that time magic will land, so Zap can still get through. Uh, but they are protected from all the elements. They're protected from instant death and from um, earth and poison. So if you're not worried about zap, then give the ribbon to someone else. You don't have to put that on the, the fighter as your carry. So the Aegis Shield would give you the, uh, the earth immunity, I think. Pretty sure it does. Is it only poison? It's so. Here's the thing, Felicent. It's it may not be, and I may be misspeaking on that. But it's so close enough that, short of chaos, I want my ribbons distributed differently, right? Like if if every fiend just decides to zap and crack me, and I happen to fall in after the first one, I go, okay, maybe it doesn't, and I throw a ribbon back on it. But um, in general, I'm trying to keep more party members alive, especially my, my white mage. Um, but we have two ribbons here, right? 
So in the case where I only have the one ribbon because we've only incentivized it and we didn't happen to bump into that Earth 4 ribbon, we look at this fighter as being like, okay, well, he's good enough to go until we get to a boss. Um, routing decision here. Right, we're in Lafane. There is a Lafane Superstore and you have a tail. Um, you gotta turn that tail in first so that way when we go to Lafane, they're already promoted and you could just load up your thief and your fighter on levels one through three or one through four magic. Uh, and then you could just bump the, the level six and seven checks for your white and black mages, which are now wizards. All right, at this point, you've now allowed yourself to committing to, I'll promote and come back, or I will promote and then have to go into each one of those other um, other towns along the way. Yeah, it is. It's it's sad. I and I'm speaking from this high horse of yeah, but I made that same mistake because I I like completely forgot I didn't have Oxiel and I I panicked, so I went to Gaia and then I was like, oh, what was I really trying to do? So yes, we we still make those the same mistakes, but uh, that's the that's one that was like that hurt me when I made it. So I'm trying to avoid you hurting yourself. Definitely turn in the tail as soon as you get it, folks. Um, especially with the very first chest we opened at 2 minutes and 10 seconds was a Vorpal plus 5. Turn in the tail. Ah, there's a lot of decision making happening right now. Here's the decision. Who gets a ribbon and move that power gauntlet to slot one of whomever is about to be my carry. So if we're going to trust that katana plus three more than the Vorpal plus five, you put the power gauntlet on run. If you want to put it on Dave, go ahead, you put it in slot one, equip everything, and move on. This was a that was a very long menuing. Um, look, is it is it worth it in winter tournament? Maybe. I don't know. I don't remember what the scaling was on that. I didn't actually play it, but I know that it was much rougher than than what the duckling seeds are. But at this level of scaling, and I'm going to constantly bring you back to that, um, we don't need to be so protected. They, they just will not hit that hard, and you will be hitting so tremendously harder because you have these plus values on the weapons. I think my biggest takeaway right now is this is not a case of you don't know what to do. It's that you don't appear to be playing with the confidence of wanting to do it and finding out you were wrong. And the teacher in me has to say that's the only way we're going to learn if we were actually wrong or if we've been lucking into things is you have to be making those mistakes or making those things that you feel might be a mistake and then recognizing, oh, this is working every time. Maybe it's not actually a mistake. As far as getting through Sky, I imagine we're going straight through. I don't mind that fight. It's not ideal. I think an eye comes up. Yeah. I remember I was on the same portion of the encounter table here. Yeah, definitely run from these. Nightmares, by the way, for the ducks. <laughs> Don't fight a nightmare. They are garbage enemies. Uh, they have such high evasion, even when they're low-scaled. Um, they are, however, weak to ice. So if you have ice three or a black shirt, uh, taking down the, the nightmares isn't too bad. But they are, they're generally overstatted. Yeah, no, a nightmare is a time waste because you're just going to be swinging like 13 times to hope that you get something. Fighter is high value target. They don't have a lot of health and they are, yeah, 2800 XP. All right, I choose up and right. I'll take right and up. I don't know who these left and downers are, but man, they're wrong. Okay, so the comment in chat from DM 
I just see the time loss from a wipe and I don't want to have that loss. If all you can see are the potential downsides, you never allow yourself the opportunity to see the potential time gain for making a, a play that is atypical to you. Um, now, I'm always going to be an advocate of a statistically significant play, right? So routing out ice and going into the Melmond continent, right? There's three key items there that are all relatively easy to get to versus this one that is going to take me through a garbage dungeon. Statistically significant, even if it's not proximity, is to go to Melmond. Um, if you're trying to be fancy, you go to ice. But I try to do the, I'm not trying to be fancy. It's, um, I'm just doing something that might be a little out of the ordinary for me. Right, down, down, right. What madness is that for the maze? So Tia has a thousand health. That's we're at 250. We're still treating it like Tia too. 460. Now it's in quad X range. Again. Don't sleep on quad X. If if there is literally only one thing that you take from this uh DM, it is by quad X. Especially at such an early level. That would have been a, a free Garland, a free Astos. All of these fiends go down in half the turns. We're skipping uh, Waterfall here. I mean, and, and you were talking about taking a grind, right? Like, imagine that this is a Black Belt Sheet, which for the, the ducks that haven't encountered that yet, <laughs> believe me, you will, and you're going to see why we what we call grinding and, and why we value it so highly in certain cases. Um, that quad X though is going to be, let's just take out an eye in one turn. <laughs> like, why am I worried about what it has? Why am I worried about what I'm swinging? Routing here, great. I would step in front of that door, right? Stepping in front of doors is always going to be uh, a free in a free step. So try to route those into into your movement around here. Otherwise, yeah, no, this is this is solid play, DM. It, it's just you have a couple of those routing mistakes, and I think you spend a tremendous amount of time in your menu that can definitely be um, just cut. You right? Like you don't, you didn't need more than half the gear you have, so you shouldn't even have to consider which half of that that half you want to get rid of. this point it seems like we are ready to go into Topher is that correct check the heal pots great so you there are I can't count the number of times that I have gone in and forgotten to restock heal pots um, especially when save on game over is a thing and you wipe out of Topher you definitely need to restock your heal pots um, I'm gonna slow this down so I can speak about Topher for a bit there was a question earlier that you asked about is the encounter rate the same? It is exactly what your normal overworld encounter rate is with the exception of Chaos Floor. If Chaos Floor encounters are on, I believe they have the Bridge of Destiny rate. But um, no, so any any of the encounters that you want to burn outside of uh, Toph before you go in for the revisited, yeah, be my guest. Like it's going to keep the same hero runs, the same everything. Um, there is this mindset around Topher that you don't want to take levels in Topher unless you are a save on game over flag being set is a really good time to take levels on Topher because that way if you bounce out, it's no big deal. Um, but on a flag set where you are not saving on game over, you're not exiting to save your levels. You should not be at least. Unless you are, you bump into a pack like this and you're like, ah, I'm, I'm going to run, 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 and throw out a nuke. And you happen to kill them all, and you're like, oh man, that just gave me an extra hit on all my weapons. Maybe, maybe you save it. But now for the most part, we're just going.
I like the use of the light axe here. I like that we're saving resources. Duck probably could have cast something. None, I wouldn't cast ice, right? He's going to resist ice there, but... Um, possibly something to just speed that up a little bit. Don't need the fast, obviously. Carry is always deceptively dangerous here, but again, 700 health. Carry 2. Quad X is going to be turn 1-able. If you want to do the Invis 2 and the fast here, I I mean, that, that seems reasonable. Fire 2, based on a stick, not so much. Yeah, those are big hits. So, I a lot of Topher is going to come down to resource management, right? We don't want to run out of resources early, but we also need to balance that with, yeah, but I also don't want to be stuck in a, a boss fight for more than one round, because every round that you stay there is another round that carry can nuke your whole team down, right? So maybe you are conserving... I generally count backwards for my fast casts, right? Um, if I have fewer than five, I'm going to reserve them for Chaos and then Tia and then Kraken. Uh, but... If you have five fast casts, by all means, just get that out. Like, get your damage going. Get a, a temper off. Get a saber bunk. Maybe, maybe you go saber bunk fast on turn one, and then you can just instantly take down the fiend on turn two. Kraken two gets this interesting reputation of like, well, either it's always going to punch down my white wizard, or I should just be evading immediately. Um. One stack of evasion here. <laughs> Wild. Talk about <laughs> putting my foot in my mouth before I had a chance to get it out. There is... Uh... Okay, well, at least she dies anyway. <laughs> um, there's just so little chance that a single Invis 2 stack is going to be the thing that saves you from Kraken. Um, that unless you're confident you're getting two of them out, just go for speed and power. We have to get, um, we have to get the, this boss down. Kraken tends to be highly evasive, and has a ton of hits. So you'll see on higher scalings, especially with more health, when you know it's going to take multiple turns, that's when you're going to see people using white shirt and invis two at the same time, right? Within the same turn. Right, so my, my point is to, I think, commit to one train of thought. You had you had your top two characters swinging, and then your bottom two were kind of buffy. And it's like, well, if we're going to go with the buff route, make sure that everyone is buffed immediately. I might say, like, even have the ninja and the black mage cast fast if they could. I don't, I don't recall what level I just saw it at. Um, I'm, I'm focused on these bigger picture things. But I would say, I want to guarantee a fast goes off. I'm going to go with a saber, and I'm going to get one stack of Invis 2. Or perhaps the ninja's holding the white shirt instead. And then the white mage can cast Invis 2, and the ninja uses Invis 2. And now the ninja can't get hit by Kraken. So you have an evasion tank going because of his high agility. Um, but it's a lot of half measures here, right? It's like, I don't want to overcommit on one thing specifically, so I'm going to do everything kind of half-heartedly, is going to cause this issue of, oh no, now I need more resource management. Oh, thank goodness for those ribbons. But yeah, ruse, ruse. So after the ninja does this defense sword the second time, the ninja no longer needs the defense sword. Dave does. If the ninja is just going to be swinging, you might want to use it to um, drink up the knight here, right? Because we're going to be we're going to be here for a couple of rounds, and if Chaos has something nasty in his pool, we want Dave to not only survive it but not have to waste his next turn. Also, uh, Vaughn, yes, the ninja here I think was set with a plus eighty on agility, and so I believe three stacks of evasion at that point is enough. And Invis 2 
Um, Invis 2 is two stacks, if I recall correctly. Where it's enough with, with the 80 agility, two stacks of Invis 2 should suffice. Pickles, can you can you just check me on that? Can you confirm that for me? Oh, that's sorry. Thank you. They were using a Roostic and a defense, not a... Yes, Invis 2 is only one stack. Using the Roostic as two stacks each. Uh, yes, it, it was a bonus to the, the class that's part of the flag set. It's not a bonus in terms of champion select. It's a bonus in terms of it was set that all ninjas should have this property before the run. Um, so so my outcome was was correct. The ninja only needed to use the defense sword twice. Um, the knight would have had to use it three times because you want five total stacks. But in Viz 2, my apologies, in Viz 2 only gives one stack each. But yeah, good game. Uh, that chaos fight went exactly how the chaos fight should go. Um, DM, is there anything else that you wanted me to cover in this? Or Ducks, do you have any questions about anything that I said or anything that I didn't say that you were concerned about throughout this run? Because I think that this was a very good run that would show um, more competency than a than a duck should have. So um, there's a lot that you could have learned from this, even without my commentary. Uh, Invis 2 plus 2 ruses would work for the knight, yes. How can you fix a couple of bad muscle memory plays? Uh, develop new muscle memory. So that is unfortunately the short of it, right? Um, which ones do you, are you saying? I, I, so I don't think it's a, a muscle memory to like go to armory, for example, right? Like that's just a, it feels good. You get a dopamine hit that you open 10 treasure chests, but none of them were relevant. Those are going to be your big ones, right? Because how do I, you see it as, okay, I'm opening 10 chests. Now I'm telling you at three seconds a chest, you're already at 30 second loss. Then you have the trap tile that you have to run away from. Then you have the peds that you bumped into. Then you have the fact that you walked off the floor. So that armory feel good moment cost you about a minute to a minute and a half in entering volcano, going there, coming back out, taking a fight, saving it, right? Um, yeah, you know what, what would be a good idea is taking a fighter seed and then only opening incentive chests and figuring out what you can do with that. Um, completely free, I suppose, are valuable, right? So completely free would be if you happen to have key while you're already at dwarfs or those two at the beginning of Dwarf Cave. I don't know that I count those first three boxes in the Temple of Fiends um, to be free. They are very greedy checks. My metric in most cases for did this run get off correctly is um, am I done with Bicky by the three minute mark? And three minutes is being generous. I, two and a half is really where my goal is. Am I done with Bicky by that mark? Because if I am not, someone else very well could and should be. Um, it seems like I don't have any more of your stream towards the end. Um, hoping, actually, let's... Hoping I get to see how many chests we did open here. And then, of course, if there are any other questions while we're here. It's possible. I'm just... I'm curious. We got about 10 seconds left. I guess not. I'm not going to see that. Yeah. Okay. And that's fine. But um, I would say whatever that number is, have it. Right? The For the ducks, you're going to be getting, like I said, a, a lot of different seeds um, with different party compositions. A fighter seed wants to be greedy, but it is a matter of don't be so greedy. Right? Like, you don't need to be perfect. You need to be good enough. Perfect is the enemy of good enough. And when you are in a race environment, you need to just be good enough. Um, or you need to be confident that good enough will work. 
right? If you're just playing for fun, if you're practicing and you're doing the what if situations and you want to feel like an all-powerful god, by all means, open every box, grind up to 50, stomp through Topher. But um, my recommendation from before still holds, I think, that you kind of want to Goldilocks this. Give yourself comfortable breathing room, right? Like the mid-20s on this 101 flag set. Then go in and try to do it at like 18. See if I was lying to you that you could do it at 18. Because what you should hopefully find, and you know what? Even when you're when you're doing this for the threshold testing, give yourself some save states. It's not something that I really do. I, I like to play through the whole thing and, and get a feel for the encounters. But if what you're doing is, what is the strategy I actually need for each of these bosses? Give yourself a save state or two and, and just keep trying that boss because if set RNG isn't on, that encounter might go a couple of different ways. Um, if you're doing ordeals, should you skip the non-incentive chests? No, you, you take the non-incentive. Ordeals chests are free. Yeah, absolutely check the ordeals chests. I, I wouldn't go out of my way to check the singleton on the four pillar floor because that's linked um, to just before the, the throne room chest. But, um, yeah, yeah, there are a handful of times, I suppose, where I've skipped ordeals chests. I mean, if you are in, like, super go mode and you're like, I could have beaten this game 30 minutes ago, I just needed a loot, and the loot happens to be at ordeals, like, just walk to the chest. But um, if you're still going, ah, I really could use a caster item here. So specifically, as Klim is suggesting here, um, a power gauntlet or a ruse stick or I don't know if that spell has changed based on on the flag set right like if, if you just need buff magic in some regards or a masa or something xcal check them I guess yeah there are far better grind tiles to check for a black belt carry but um, it is one that is often overlooked and if you happen to find the good grind on it you do get a, a a head start on a lot of people. It is, however, an unsafe tile. So even a good grind on that tile or deals is a very unsafe environment. So one of the things I tried to call your attention to before, and, and this goes for everybody that's that's with us. So thank you, by the way, for, for everybody that's stuck around for this, this long and, and still here. Um, sea Shrine was an awful place to take fights because you have so many packs of so many different creatures. Ordeals is a very dangerous place to take a grind if you are not on a safe tile. So the only safe tile is really that one that's immediately in the door um, on the last floor. The one before the throne is not exactly safe, and the one uh, in the four-pillar part of the maze is not. Yeah, Pickles is absolutely right here. You'd want to know the pillar order to get out of Ordeals, so that way you don't take a full grind and then you're forced to try to get a solo black belt out because one of the biggest issues with a black belt grind there um, is that you're going to run out of heal potions. Are there any other questions from any of our viewers on this? Uh, with regards to either the VOD or something that came up with the VOD or just something that popped into your head as we're having this discussion because otherwise, uh, yeah, DM, you're absolutely, you're welcome. And uh, thank you for allowing me to do this. And I hope that it was valuable and not just me rambling for an hour and a half. Um, what I mean by a, a safe grind tile is that some of those trap tiles are set up so that they are exactly one step away from a door or a bottom wall of a room, which means that it wouldn't advance the encounter table. So when you step off the tile, there is no chance that you're going to accidentally die to another thing. Um, and some of the, the power in the grind tile, in the, the trap tile rather, what would make it a grind tile as opposed to a trap tile is that you are choosing to take one or usually one character um, to a higher level by killing off your party. And so you don't want to run this risk that while that one character is gaining levels, they somehow bump into a pack that you weren't expecting and then, then it kills them. There have been many a run lost to, uh, 
to an off step on a grind tile. All right. Well, I believe that'll do it for our first VOD review of Duck Boot Camp 2024. So thank you all for coming along. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, thank you for sticking it out, and I hope you learned something there too. If you haven't yet, please join the FFR Discord um, and FinalFantasyRandomizer.com. That's where we would get any of these... Uh, these flags go in. There's so many options. This is such a great time. I love doing this. I love uh, being part of the community. I love having all our ducks here coming to learn. Um, and I hope that uh, they continue to do so so that we can keep this uh, getting even more competitive. So um, for the last time, thank you all and have a wonderful night.